George for his invitation to come along. I think I'm really just here because Ian couldn't do the Sunday morning to tell you the truth, but I don't mind being a substitute anyhow. But it's lovely to be here this morning. We trust the Lord will bless his word to us. We're turning to Songs of Solomon, please. Songs of Solomon in chapter 2. We're in a harvest service. I want to read these verses. And I want to think about the flowers and the fruit and the feast. And we really want to think about the friends we find verses here. Songs of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 1 please. Songs of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 1. The word of God says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. But I'm there, and we trust the Lord again. Please keep your Bible open. We want to turn to your face here and there as we pray the meeting this morning. So these verses, they bring before us flowers. There's roses there and there's lilies there. And they bring before us fruit. There's apples. And the, there's a feast. There's a banqueting house. But what I want to notice most of all is the friend. If you notice there at verse 6, it says, His right hand is under my head and his left hand doth embrace me, or his right hand is on, or his left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. The one who gives all things is the one who never leaves us nor forsakes us. It's the great I am. You'll find there in verse 1, if you look at it, it says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Our attention is drawn to the I am. Now, many of the scholars, if you get a commentary in the Songs of Solomon, many of the scholars will say, well, this is Solomon, and he's He's writing about himself, and he's describing himself as the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. But when you come to the Gospels, when you come to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, just let me read it for you in verse 28. The Lord Jesus says, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The Lord Jesus is saying, Well, you can't. You just can't compare Solomon to a lily because he, he was never compared like unto one of these. And when we see the first verse here in Songs of Solomon, chapter 2, we're brought before us the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the great I am. He is the rose of Sharon, and he is the lily of the valleys. We'll remember in John's gospel, the Lord Jesus uses that phrase about himself a number of times, perhaps seven times or maybe eight. In chapter 6, he says, I am the bread of life. And that reminds us about our sustenance. He is the one who is the bread of life. In John chapter 8, the Lord Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And that's our guidance. He's the one who gives us light to step in this dark world of sin. In John chapter 10, he said, I am the door. And that's our entrance. That's how we get in. The Lord Jesus, of course, has led us in to the family of God through that wonderful door of grace that had been opened at the place called Calvary. In chapter 10, again, the Lord Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And of course, the good shepherd is our obedience because in verse 27, it says, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. You know, if the Lord is really our shepherd, then we follow him and we obey his word. And sometimes our testimony is brought into doubt when we see people disobeying the word of God. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me, the Lord Jesus said. So the Lord Jesus is our sustenance and he's our guidance and he's our entrance and he's our obedience and in chapter 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. That's our confidence. The Lord Jesus said, because I live, ye shall live also. And what confidence we have in the wonderful person of the risen Lord Jesus. In chapter 14, of course, he said, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that's our experience. We have experienced that Jesus is the way. The way through every problem and every pathway is the Lord Jesus. He is the way. That's our experience. In John chapter 15, he said, I am the vine and ye are the branches. 
And that's our dependence. We're depending on Him. He's the one who, who holds us up. He's the one who sustains us. He's the one who gives us that wonderful life. And when we read here, if you look at verse 1 again in Sons of Solomon chapter 2, when we read, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys, we're focusing in on the lovely Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing we notice in verse 1 is His beauty. Look what it says there in verse 1. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. When we see the roses and the lilies together, all the colors and all the fragrances, and when we think about the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can say He is altogether lovely. This is a little picture about the beauty of the Son of God. This is the spectacular Son of God. And what a wonderful picture it is. The ladies in the church have done a fantastic job of putting all the flowers. I know that a lady did that because a man couldn't do that. Most men have hands on them like feet and they couldn't just get it right. And when we see this lovely picture in the Word of God, we're seeing the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 1 again. Not only does it present to us a picture of the beauty of the Lord Jesus, the spectacular Son of God, it brings before us a picture of the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Look what it says, I am the Rose of Sharon. The Rose of Sharon grew on a particular plain in Israel called the Plain of Sharon. And if you were to go to the place called Joppa, remember Jonah went down to Joppa to get a ship to go to Tarshish. He was going to sunny Spain. And from Joppa, about 35 miles north to Caesarea, is the plain of Sharon. And that's where the Rose of Sharon grew. And I am told by scholars that the Rose of Sharon, it grows in three different colors. You can get a white Rose of Sharon, you can get a red Rose of Sharon, and you can get a purple Rose of Sharon. And you see, when the Lord says, or when the Word of God says, I am the Rose of Sharon, and the lily of the valleys, we're seeing the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ, but when he says, I am the rose of Sharon, we're seeing the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we see the white rose of Sharon, it, it points us to the absolute sinless perfection of Jesus Christ. It says purity. It shows us that Jesus Christ is suitable for the cross. Remember Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26 says, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Remember 1 Peter 2, verse 22 says, He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And when we see the white rose of Sharon, it's reminding us of the sinless Son of God, reminding us that Jesus Christ is suitable for the cross. Because he is without sin, he can bear our sins in his own body in the tree. When we find the rose of Sharon in its red form, it reminds us of the suffering Son of God. And when we see the red rose of Sharon, we're reminded of the precious blood that the Lord Jesus shed on the old rugged cross. Keep your finger in the place and come back a page or two in your Bible to Psalm 22, please. Psalm 22 and verse 6. The red rose of Sharon pictures Christ's suffering on the cross. Now, in Psalm 22, verse 6, perhaps you know the verse anyway, but it says, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Now, that word worm, this is describing the Lord Jesus on the old rugged cross at Calvary. And he says, but I am a worm and no man. The reason he's described as a worm is because a worm can't run away. And the Lord Jesus had no, no intention of running away anyhow. A worm has got no protection. There's no hairs on a worm, just, just skin the nakedness. It's showing us the Savior exposed on the cross to all the sufferings of man and all the judgment of God. Now, the word translated worm there, and eight, eight times in the King James Bible is translated worm, 34 times is translated scarlet, and one time is translated crimson. And we're seeing the red rose of Sharon here, Jesus Christ on the cross. You find the word twice, actually, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Remember what it says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your uh, sins be as scarlet, that's the same word, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, and that's the same word, they shall be as wool. And here's the Lord Jesus now on the cross, shedding his precious blood. And he says, I am a worm. He's just a scarlet thing. And when we see the white rose of Sharon, it's pointing us to the purity, Jesus Christ suitable for the cross. When we see the red rose of Sharon, it's pointing us to the suffering Son of God. He's on the cross, shedding his precious blood for us. 
Come back to Songs of Solomon, chapter 2. When we find the rose of Sharon in its purple form, of course we know that purple is the, is the royal color, and that's pointing us to the sovereign Son of God. This is not Jesus suitable for the cross or suffering on the cross. This is the Lord Jesus sovereign after the cross. The hymn writer says, The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. And we can see the wonderful ministry of the Lord Jesus just in the rose of Sharon. The purity, the sinless Son of God, the suffering Son of God, the sovereign Son of God. And when we take the whole verse, we see the spectacular Son of God, and we can say that He is altogether lovely. Now look at verse 1 again. Not only can we see the beauty of the Lord Jesus as we consider the flowers, and not only can we see the ministry of the Lord Jesus, but I want to notice the sympathy of the Lord Jesus. It says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. You'll mark the S in that verse. There's a hymn in our hymn books, and we sing that he's the lily of the valley, and it, it's not right. I always try to encourage the congregations to sing the valleys, because that's what it says here. He's the lily of the valleys. And dear friends, sooner or later, in your life and, and my life, and I have been through a valley or two, I can tell you, we'll come to the valley experiences of life. And we'll be right down in the very depths. And some believers this morning, perhaps, are even in the valley of despair. That's where Elijah was. You remember that he got the death threat. We're going to look at him in a moment or two. And he ran away, and he went down and sat under a juniper tree, requested for himself that he might die. And there he is, and he's, he's in the valley of despair. But just down there in the valley of despair, he discovers that Jesus Christ is the lily of the valleys. And he meets him there. Perhaps as a believer this morning in the valley of disappointment, things haven't worked just out the way you wanted them to, and, and maybe you're even blaming the Lord. Remember the two on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, and, and they were in the valley of disappointment. They had been at Calvary, and, and they had turned their back on the, on the crucified Lord, and they had started to go down home to Emmaus, and they're walking down, and, and they're disappointed in Christ. That We trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed Israel in, in Luke 24, 21. It's all in the past tense. They're not doing any trusting now. And the Bible tells that they walked and were sad, and they discovered in the valley of disappointment that Jesus Christ was the lily of that valley too. We read that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Maybe you're in the valley of distress. Mary was in the valley of distress in John chapter 20. Remember, she had went to the garden tomb and she's absolutely in pieces. Her heart is broken and she's weeping. And the angel said to her, what are you weeping for? She says, they have taken away my Lord and I know not where they have led him. And she's in the valley of distress, and she turns around, and there the Lord Jesus, the lily of the valleys, is standing right behind her. And if you're in the valley of distress, remember, the Lord Jesus is there. If you're in the valley of despair, remember, the Lord Jesus is there with you. If you're in the valley of disappointment, the Lord Jesus is there with you. David talks about the valley of death, and he discovered that even there, that the Lord Jesus was the lily of that valley too. Our sympathizing Savior is always there. Come to uh, Hebrews chapter 13, please. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. And uh, <clears throat> I include these verses in a lot of sermons because it's so vital that we remember these promises and these words that were spoken by the Lord Jesus himself. Even though we find them in the book of Hebrews, they are the actual words of the Lord Jesus. It says, for he hath said, this is what the Lord Jesus has said. Now, look what it says, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, please. And this just reminds us again that He is the lily of the valleys. No matter where you go, child of God, no matter what circumstances you face, no matter what uh, cloud comes all around you, you can be sure that the Lord Jesus has not forsaken you. Now, look what it says, Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for He hath said... He hath said. There's two things in the Bible that we're told that the Lord Jesus said, but we don't know where he said them. One of them is here. He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The other one is found in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus when he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And those two things are in the Bible. We're told that he said them, but we're not told where he said them. And I think that's very significant. 
if he had a justice said them to Mary, for, for instance, as she stood in the valley of despair, we would say, well, that's, that's just for her and that's not for me. But, but we can't find out where he said them and we can take them to ourselves this morning. Now, look what it says. Be content with such things as you have, for, for he hath said. And I have just written in my notes there, that's undeniable. Psalm 119, verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. He has said it's undeniable. Nobody can go against it. I know people are going against the Word of God and they're going against the Son of God and they're going against the people of God. But I'll tell you, friends, this is absolutely undeniable because He has said it. Now look what it says. He has said, I will never leave thee. And you notice too that it's unconditional. It doesn't say, I will never leave thee if thou art doing well. I will never leave thee if thou art on the narrow path and keeping the commandments or whatever it might be. You see, dear friend, this is absolutely unconditional. If you're a backslider this morning, I want to tell you that this counts for you too. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It's unconditional. It's not dependent on you. It's not dependent on how you're feeling. It's not dependent on how you're doing. It's not dependent on how much you're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not dependent on how often you're praying or reading the Bible. This is absolutely 100% unconditional for every child of God. This is the wonderful grace of God. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Look what it says. He has said that's undeniable, and I will never leave thee, that's unconditional. And then it says, nor forsake thee, that's unmistakable. It's nearly the same as I will never leave thee, isn't it? He says it twice so that you would never be mistaken that the Lord is with you every single step of every single moment of every single day. And then look what it says in verse 6 so that we may boldly say the Lord is. You see, it's unstoppable. That will never say the Lord was. <laughs> It'll never say the Lord will be when you're getting it tight. No, it says that we may boldly say the Lord is. You see, it's undeniable and it's unconditional and it's unmistakable, but it's unstoppable. You could never stop this. The Lord is my helper. Look what it says. And that's unbeatable. I've had many a helper. I was a joiner for 20 years, and sometimes we get a young fellow along to serve his time with us, and when I tell you, you'd have been far, far better without him. And he was only in your road. Uh, and sometimes you could have killed him, and, but you're really trying to learn him. And, but you see, this is the Lord is my helper, and that's unbeatable. You couldn't beat the Lord being your helper. As we picked her up in our house, in fact, there's a big picture, and it says, Romans chapter 8, verse 31, If God be for us, who shall be against us? What a helper. Oh, dear friends, can you see the lily of the valleys here? He hath promised. It's undeniable, and it's unconditional, and it's unmistakable, and it's unstoppable, and it's unbeatable. And then look what it says, And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. It's unshakable. Our fear or our peace should never be shaken, because we have a helper who is the Lord of glory. He's the lily of the valleys. And no matter what valley you would ever get into, you can be absolutely sure that the Lord is there. Come to 1 Kings chapter 19. We want to look at Elijah for a minute or two in the valley of despair. This, this is where he was. He was right down in the, in the valley of despair, and he discovered that in the valley of despair that Jesus the Lord was the lily of the valleys. Now look at 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 3. <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 3 says, it says, and when he saw that, there was a particular thing that happened that he saw that, that, that really shaked him up and disturbed him. It says, when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. A few days before this, of course, we, we know that Elijah was on the mountaintop. And Elijah had defeated the, the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove. He was outnumbered 850 to 1. And that's not powerful odds, but with God on his side, he defeated the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove. And then he had put the sacrifice and he had thrown water over it and he had drenched it and made it that if God didn't do it, then nothing would be done. He was going to be a fool for Christ's sake on the mountain. If God didn't work, he was going to look an absolute idiot. But he prayed and fire came down from heaven and, and the power of God was manifested. And then it hadn't rained for three and a half years and the man's down on his knees and he's, he's praying for rain. And next thing there's a, there's a wee hand-shaped cloud. And next thing the, the sky is black and the rain is falling down and he's on the mountaintop of blessing with God. And then look at verse 3. 
It says, and when he saw that. You see, that was the death threat that Jezebel put on him. Instead of proclaiming him a national hero, instead of saying, look, this is a great man. He's brought water. We haven't had rain for three and a half years, and, and this is a mighty man. He's put false religion out of the country. Let's have a party and proclaim Elijah. But he got a death threat instead. Now, look what it says. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. And you can see his fearfulness, first of all. Fear has filled his heart. This man who was on the mountain with God, and this man who had got answers to prayer, and this man who had defeated the enemies, and next thing he's, he's scared of a woman, one single woman. And he's only after beating 850 men and slaying them with the sword. And he ran for his life, and he, he left uh, the place where he was, and, and he went down to Beersheba. It's 100 miles. The place where he was, of course, up on Mount Carmel, Jezreel in the north, was in the, the plain of Sharon. It was a beautiful place a very fertile place, and he, and he runs to Beersheba, 100 miles, and it's, it's a desert. That's all it is. And he's left this beautiful place, and he's come to this barren place, and you can see his fearfulness. He's lost his peace. Look at verse 4. It says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. You can see his loneliness now. He's left his servant. You'd have thought, if it had been me, I'd have took the old servant with me. At least he could carry the bags, or he could make you a cup of tea or something. But he left him, and he went himself. And you know, dear friends, very often when believers are in the valley of despair, what they do, they, they don't come to fellowship with anybody. I'm not going to the meeting because I'm falling out with God, and I'm falling out with the believers as well, and I'm feeling sorry for myself, and I'm in the valley of despair, you know, and, and I'm not going out. And that's what Elijah did. He cut himself off from fellowship, and you can see his fearfulness, and you can see his loneliness. And then look what it says, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. You can see his helplessness. He just can't go on. He's just sitting down in this desert place, and he just feels, well, this is the end of a road for me. I can go no further. I can't take another step. And you can see that he's right down in the valley of despair. Look what it says. And he requested for himself that he might die. You can see his desperateness. You know, sometimes when we're in the valley of despair, we pray stupid things, don't we? And we say stupid things. And we can see the wonderful grace of God here because this remains one of the unanswered prayers of the Bible. This man, I don't know, I'm guessing 15 or 1600 years before Christ was born, he prayed that he might die, and I'll tell you, he hasn't even died yet. He hasn't died yet. You see, God doesn't answer our stupid prayers when we're down in the valley of despair. And you can see his desperateness. He just wants to die. And said, it is enough, Lord. Oh, now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, you can see his weariness. He's, he's right down in the valley of despair. He, he's alone. He's weak. He's weary. He's suicidal. He's at the very end of his tether. Now, look what it says. Behold, then, just when he'd reached the bottom, behold, then, an angel touched him. Now, just in case you and I would be thinking, that's just an ordinary angel from heaven coming to touch him, look quickly down to verse 7. It says in verse 7, and the angel of the Lord, that's different, isn't it? The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is almost always the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a theophany, a, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord of glory. Look what it says in verse 7, and the angel of the Lord came again the second time. So it was him the first time as well. Look what it says in verse 5 now. Behold, then an angel touched him, and you can see the Lord's nearness even though he's right down in the valley of despair. And I'll tell you, friends, he's out of fellowship. He's not going to the meeting anymore. He's not praying. He's only prayed a stupid prayer that he might die. He's not reading his Bible. He's not in fellowship with the Lord. But I want you to see the Lord's nearness. The Lord has touched him. Because the Lord has promised, you see, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And even though you're in a place maybe where you're not going to the meeting and, and you're not praying and you're not reading your Bible and you've given up on the whole thing, dear friend, God hasn't given up on you because he's the lily of the valleys, you see. And right down in the valley of despair, Elijah realized that Jesus, the Lord of glory, was the lily of the valleys. Look what it says. Behold then, an angel touched him. That's the Lord's nearness. And said unto him to rise and eat. 
I want you to see the Lord's graciousness. If it had been me, I'd have struck my toe on him and said, what are you doing here? Would you not take yourself up and get away back to your work? No. The Lord just says, look, arise and eat. There's no rebuke. There's no reproof. He just comes graciously near, and he just says, arise and eat. That's what you need just now. Verse 6. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. That's the Lord's goodness. The Lord's just providing for his needs. He didn't ask for it, mind you. He didn't, this wasn't a mighty answer to prayer or anything. This is just the Lord coming alongside, and this is just the Lord supplying the needs of his people because he's the lily of the valleys. And then verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came again the second time. That's the Lord's faithfulness. And touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And that's the Lord's tenderness. You see, he's the lily of the valleys. And if you're in the valley of despair, I want to tell you, friend, I want to tell you in the authority of God's word that the Lord Jesus is within arm's length of you this morning. And if you're in the valley of distress, the Lord Jesus is right there too. If you're in the valley of disappointment, there's maybe young people here this morning, there is, and we're glad to see you. And life can be disappointing, and you can have your eye on a fella, some young girl, and he's away with somebody else, you're disappointed. And maybe if you're eyeing a girl, some young fella, and she's away with somebody else, and you're disappointed. Or maybe you didn't get the mark you wanted, and you didn't get the place you wanted, and you didn't get the school you wanted, and you're disappointed. Remember, for Christian young people, the Lord Jesus is the lily of the valleys of disappointment. And he's right there beside you, and don't despair. Don't despair, because the Lord has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. When David was down in the valley of the shadow of death, he discovered that the Lord was the lily of that valley too. We can see, come back to Songs of Solomon, please. Maybe that's where you are just now. The time is gone. I'm just going to rush through the verses and we'll be finished in a minute. You can see his beauty, the spectacular Son of God. You can see his ministry. You can see his sympathy. I want you to see his generosity. Look at verse 3, just for a few moments, please. His generosity. It says, As the apple tree among the trees of the wood... So was my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. You see, at the start, the writer is comparing himself to a, a rose and a lily. But now the believer, the, the bride, is, is comparing him, her beloved one, the Lord, I believe it is, to an apple tree. Now, why would you compare anybody to an apple tree? Look what it says here. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. Well, an apple tree has got a form. It's unique because of its form. When I was in Limavati as the pastor there, I got friendly with a man called John Campbell. I'm still friendly with him. He's a retired policeman. And, and we used to go for walks, maybe 10 mile in the morning or something like that there. And he, he knew everything about trees. And I said, what sort of trees that? Oh, that's a birch tree and that's a rowan tree. And in fact, we're walking in Lurgan Park and he said, those trees down Lurgan Park, they're lime trees. And, and there's oak trees and chestnut trees. And, but when I came to the apple tree, I didn't need him to tell me that that's an apple tree because every dummy knows what an apple tree is because there's something about the form of it. It's absolutely unique. And, and the Lord Jesus, there's something unique about him. You, you would just recognize him because of his love and mercy and grace. He says, I'm comparing him to an apple tree because of his four. And friends, those of us who are saved this morning, we ought to be recognizable in this old world. When we're following the Lord Jesus and when we're obeying his word and, and when we're living for him, the people will have no bother knowing that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Peter and John in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13? It says, but when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and, and perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned men, they, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. There was just something about them. It wasn't their education or their eloquence. It, it was that they had been with the Lord Jesus Christ. What's wrong today, dear friends, is this, that the believer has lost their identity. There's very little difference nowadays. If you're doing business, I've done business with, with non-believers and I've done business with believers. And the people who hasn't paid us for roofing his house was a believer. You see, the believer's lost his identity. He's no more a man of integrity, a man of decency or honesty. And what the world needs more than anything else is believers to be what they're supposed to be that they might be recognizable. Even, even you lost out, or even you have to say sorry, or even you have to take the wrong. Just because Jesus Christ is our Savior, we need to stand out for Him. 
The apple tree, there's something special about its form. There's something special about its fragrance as well. The lovely fragrance of the apple blossom is beautiful. And when the Lord Jesus was on his way to Calvary, it says that he, he offered himself to God as a sweet-smelling savor. Some of the brethren in the prayer meeting this morning prayed about the fragrance of Jesus Christ, and I said, well, that's wonderful. Because there was a lovely fragrance about the, about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you bumped into him, all you got was fragrance. If you stepped on his toe, all you got was fragrance. And the apple tree, there's something about his form, there's something about his fragrance, and there's something about his fruit. Look what it says, I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. How wonderful is the fruit that the Lord Jesus has given to us. Look at verse 3. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so was my beloved among the sons. I sat down. That's the fruit of his rest. I sat down. How wonderful it is just to rest in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. We're not worried about our sins. We're not worried about going to hell. We're resting in the finished work of Christ. And the fruit of his rest is there. And then it says, I sat down under his shadow. That's the fruit of his protection. As it Psalm 91 verse 1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What a wonderful place. You can see his generosity here. He's given us rest. He's, he's given us protection. Look what it says. I sat down under his shadow with great delight. Oh, he gives us joy. What joy it is. As in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 10 says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. You see, friends, when we lose our joy, we lose our strength. And when we lose our strength, we can't be faithful. And we'll be missing from the prayer meeting. We'll be missing from the Lord's table. When we lose our joy, you see, we'll lose our strength to be faithful to Him. And He has given us joy. And He's given us rest. And He's given us protection. And then look what it says. With great delight and His fruit was sweet to my taste. And that's satisfaction. He's the satisfying Son of God. He's the suffering Son of God. He's the splendid Son of God. Now, I want to move on here, but look at verse 4. Just two minutes and we'll be finished. Look at verse 4. I want you to see that He's not just the, the sovereign Son and the sympathizing Son and the suffering Son and the satisfying Son. Look at verse 4. He brought me to the banqueting house, and His banner over me was love. He's the sheltering Son of God. And friend, were you sit this morning and where I stand this morning, His banner over me is love. What a place to live. That's where we're living. We're living under the banner of the wonderful, matchless grace and love of God. He brought me to, we, we sing a course, he brought me into his banqueting house and his banner over me is love. But that's not what it says, sure it's not. He brought me to. Didn't bring me into it, he just brought me to it. That word translated banqueting house there is also translated wine press. It's a place of judgment. And he brought us to the place of judgment but it never touched us because his banner over us is love. And that's the picture. He's the sheltering son of God. Look at verse 6. I'm finished here in verse 6. It says, His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. And you can see that he's the supporting son of God. For every believer, for every moment, for every step, for every situation, his left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. That's where the Lord is. That's how close he is. That's our Savior. He's the supporting Son of God. And if you need supported in your troubles, He's the supporting Son of God. He's the one who draws near. If you get somebody that you're allowed to do this with and put your left hand under their head and put their right hand around them, you'll see how close the Lord is to you this morning. And we can see the flowers and we can see the fruit and we can see the feasting house, but I just want you to see the friend. As a Proverbs 18, 24 he that hath friends must show himself to be friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and Jesus is his name. May the Lord bless his word to your hearts this morning.